<clears throat> okay, well, hello. Uh, I'm Gray Ribka. It's good to be back. I haven't been back for a while. Um, some familiar faces out there. I'm here to tell you about ADMX, the Axion Dark Matter Experiment, some of our recent results. There's a picture of... <clears throat> There's a picture of our apparatus uh, hanging nicely in the clean room before it goes into a magnet. And I'll tell you about why all these parts are here. Um, that's about as good as it looks. So um, this is all about dark matter. So um, we have evidence for dark matter. We have evidence for dark matter at almost all scales. Certainly the big ones. You, the entire observable universe. You look at the CMB. There's evidence for dark matter there. You look at Clusters of galaxies. This is a, the, 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 the Zwicky thing. There's evidence for dark matter there. You look at individual galaxies, the, the Vera Rubin measurement. There's evidence for dark matter there. And these are, these are, there's like big differences in scales here. We're going from the Hubble volume to megaparsecs to kiloparsecs. And so it's natural just to keep walking your way down in the next place that we should be able to say that we have evidence for dark matter is at the laboratory benchtop scale. And that's where it is sorely lacking. Um, so that's what we have to do is we have to find it. Um, what is dark matter? Well, we don't know. We know there's a lot of it. We know that most that, that <clears throat> most of the matter in the universe is this dark matter. We know that it's cold. It's non-relativistic. It has to be feebly interacting, uh, if at all. Um, it has to be produced quite early in the universe, um, and there's nothing in the standard model that fits the bill. So uh, beyond that, uh, the choice is kind of yours. Um, there's many ideas out there. There's, there's two community favorites. There's WIMPs, which I will not mention again, and then there's Axions. Um, and uh, ADMX is an experiment, um, one of the DOE Gen 2 flagship dark matter experiments is looking, the only one looking for Axions. Um, why, why do I like Axions? Well, it's, it's um, uh, 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 to, to, to take the words of, of the late Ann Nelson, who I really looked up to, um, Theories with dark matter axions are, are, very, are the, the very elite theories that are natural, elegant, and yet also not ruled out yet. Um, and it's just that's really persuasive and a reason that you want to be doing this. Um, so a bit of reminder about the axion. Um, so uh, it starts with, with what's called the strong CP problem. So QCD, it's naturally CP violating from various things. And you could naively expect if all of your terms in the QC Lagrangian were chosen at, at random. Um, a neutron electric dipole moment, it would be pretty big. Uh, it's not. As far as we can tell, there's, there's no neutron electric dipole moment, or at least it's 10 orders of magnitude smaller um, uh, than it, it should be. And I suppose, Brad, you'll tell me that it's, it's going to be 13 orders. Once, once you're done with it, you'll, you'll say 13 orders, or maybe you'll find it. Anyway, so this is odd. Things, things do not cancel out. Just different numbers that you plug into an equation of order one do not cancel out to a part in 10 to the 10 by accident. There has to be a reason for this. And perhaps the best explanation out there is a, a new symmetry called peche quinn symmetry that naturally and dynamically uh, cancels CP violation in the strong se sector. The neutron electric dipole moment goes away. Um, and the only side effect is that you have to add a new particle, and it's called the axion. And the axion originally thought to be at the weak scale, because all the good stuff is at the weak scale. That was ruled out um, through accelerators. And so the, the idea is that there's this, this invisible axion, which is extremely light and extremely weakly coupled, which is a very popular choice for a particle because it's, it's very light, very weakly coupled. You won't see it at accelerators. It won't interact with the thing. It won't cause any problems. There's no way to prove it wrong. Kind of um, problem solved. <clears throat> and the axion, yeah, it have some interactions. For example, if it's very, very weakly coupled, this axion to two photon vertex would be one of the axions it could have. Um, and uh, if you want to be solving this strong CP problem, the relationship between axion mass and coupling is fairly, fairly well fixed. There's, I'll mention the, the KSVZ and DFSC, DS, DFSC benchmark models, which only change by about a factor of 10 in what their coupling is. Um, and they're motivated. I, the, the, the DFSC is perhaps, perhaps slightly more motivated. It's also the one with the weaker coupling and harder to, to do. So here we've got this new particle, the axion that's simply a side effect of solving the strong CP problem, and it's very light, very weakly coupled, probably won't bother us at all until we look and say, what does the axion look like in the early universe? And it turns out that when this peche quinn symmetry is broken, when the universe is very hot, a huge amount of energy is dumped into the axion field. So you know, nothing is in thermal equilibrium here. We're just dumping a huge amount of energy into this axion field. And so we have a whole lot of energy stored 
in a field that is light, weakly coupled, we wouldn't see now. By the way, when it's produced, it's fairly cold. This is starting to sound like our dark matter problem. Um, and so it turns out that, that up to two corrections, somewhere within the axions with masses between one and 100 microEV would be produced in about the right amount of quantities to account for some or all of the dark matter we see. And it seems this is a match made in heaven. Here is a particle that's predicted for entirely different reasons in nuclear physics. Just goes and solves the dark matter problem. This is extremely compelling to, to go look for. And so let me give an experimentalist view on looking for the axion. So <clears throat> um, here is here's a, a plot that I'll show you a lot. On the y-axis, there is the axion-photon coupling. On the x-axis is the axion mass. The experimentalists want to know what's the mass of the new particle, what's the coupling. Um, the, the, the theorist, this is, this is related to one over the Pet J. Quinn scale. I told you there's benchmark models that relate these two. So most of this plot is not this, this QCD solving axion that I talked about, it's axion like particles. It is mostly these lines. Well, it's hard to, to get my angle here. These lines, the KSVZ and DFSE models. This is where you want to be if you want to solve the strong CP problem. You can see there's a lot of bounds already out there from astrophysics and other dedicated experiments that have excluded parameter space for axion-like particles, but the ones that are really interesting in digging into these, uh, this, this, this QCD axion space are called halescopes. Let me zoom in there. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm zooming in, so still axion coupling with photons, axion mass, there's our benchmark models, so we want to be looking between these pink lines. Um, and I've also said that if you want axions to be some or all of dark matter, that, that you need certain masses for that. And so I've taken the last few years worth of archive predictions of what the right axion mass to make dark matter is. They disagree, but they don't disagree by a huge amount. From an experimentalist view, I look at them and say, oh, there's a, there's a clear, there's an, er there's an uncertainty here. And so to be looking for axion dark matter, I should be covering this range here. Um, so that's the plan going around you know, in, in, the, in the ones to tens of microAV experiment and using an experiment called a haloscope. And uh, before I go into exactly what a haloscope is, um, I've taken the liberty of kind of um, I'm ransacking through your, your demo uh, uh, room there with, with the, the help of your um, the demo person to, to recreate this. Because I, I, I talk to my, my students in my intro mechanics class when we're doing waves about this. Uh, and so the demo here is it's, it's talking about resonant conversion of power. So I have one resonator here, a tuning fork. I have another resonator there, another tuning fork. They're tuned to the exactly the same frequency. At least that was the plan. They're not touching, right? All we've got is, these, is, is the air between. That's a very weak coupling between resonators. And to see if I can get power into this tuning fork, we've balanced a ping pong ball against it. So ideally, the, the demo goes, I give this a whack. I put power into this. I set it right there. And you can see I can efficiently transfer power from one tuning fork to another as long as they're on the same resonant frequency. Now, the, when I do this back home, I have a, I, the, one of the tuning forks is, is tunable. And so I do that, and I say, look, when they're on resonance, I get power right across. But they have to be very, very close on resonance as I slightly detune them. And uh, I, the, what are the best I could get here is I, I got a clip that I'll put in here. And so clearly, this is going to be detuned. It probably also has a lot of loss. So we'll set it there. I do the same experiment. and you get no power transfer whatsoever between the two. And so um, the reason I'm doing this is to get back to axion dark matter is this is the same equations of motion um, for a axion haloscope, which is looking for axion dark matter, and that's one resonator, that's one field. So I, I, and I do this because a lot of people are used to the like particle dark matter, small stuff, stuff is, it's like thinking of atoms bouncing off other atoms. Um, this is, no, this is a wave. The axion dark matter is a wave. It has a wavelength larger than this room. So it's a, it's, a, it's a vibrating field, and we're trying to detect it by turning it into photons. And the photons have a wavelength that is person-sized. So it's very wavy. And so one of these resonators is axion dark matter. The other is an electromagnetic cavity resonance. And these two things are coupled by that axion to two photon vertex. One of the photons is provided by a strong magnetic field. And so you get this axion photon coupling. And as long as your electromagnetic cavity resonance is tuned to exactly the same frequency as the frequency can, corresponding to, to h bar omega of your, your um, uh, h bar omega equals axion mass, 
then you get resonant, resonant coupling between the dark matter axion field and the cavity, and you can turn dark matter into detectable microwave photons. Um, so moving, moving away from that and talking uh, uh, about just axions themselves, so we, we have this magnet that provides the, the extra photon. We've got a resonant cavity. Axions come in, scatter off the magnetic field. So this is a very particle view, right? Is so, so here it's looking like a single axion comes and bounces off one of these photons. It's the same thing. Um, uh, then this photon bounces around in this cavity, and you pick it up, amplify it, and detect it. So detecting photons is something we're fairly good at. Um, and when you're looking for axions, an axion signal like this, your background is going to be mostly thermal. So black body radiation, the cavity has a temperature, it radiates into itself, there's some thermal population of photons. You'd like that to be really small so you can see the axion signal photons, and you would like as many axion signal photons as possible. The signal is proportional to the volume of the, the cavity. Bigger cavity, more dark matter inside, more photons out. That's pretty straightforward. The larger the magnetic field, the more photons to scatter off of the axion has. And the cavity Q, the resonant quality, the fact, quality factor of the, 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 the cavity, as long as it is tuned to the axion frequency, the more resonant it is, the better, up to the point where it's, if, if the, the photon lifetime of the cavity exceeds the coherence time of the axion field, that's where you run into, uh, you don't get any more benefit out of that. We're nowhere close to that, so higher cavity Q is always better for right now. We're looking for this above the back black body noise, and so you want the cavity to be as cold as possible. This means deep cryogenics. And you want your amplifier noise to be as low as possible, which takes you into some very interesting um, amplifier space that I'll talk more about later. So one more cartoon uh, about how this works. So looking slightly more realistic here, there's a cavity right now. We're using a right circular cylinder. Of course, I've told you that you need to be on the right frequency that corresponds to the axion mass, so you have to make this tunable. This rod indicates the, that you have to change the geometry to tune it. The signal that you're looking for, these photons come out here, you amplify, you make a power spectrum, so you're making a power, power versus frequency around the cavity resonance. And what we're hoping to see is white noise, white noise, white noise, white noise, peak indicating extra power coming into my experiment from out there with no other known source that indicates um, axion dark matter is converting in my, in my cavity. Now, of course, it won't look this good. This is, this is enhanced for, being, uh, uh, for the purposes of seeing it. So that's the idea behind an axion haloscope, looking for the axions of the dark matter halo. Um, here is the group I'm part of, ADMXG2, that's doing it. There we are at the, the experiment site at the University of Washington, where the experiment's located. So looking at the, uh, the, the experiment design itself, there you have on the left a cutaway view. Um, the, the, the heart of the experiment there, that's the, that's the microwave cavity. We have two tuning rods to give you a sense of scale. The cavity is about that high. The tuning rods are about the size of baseball bats. They're all copper coated. Um, it sits inside this magnet. This is about an eight Tesla magnet here. Above that, space for cryogenic refrigeration, a dilution refrigerator. Also the, mo the, the motors and gearboxes that move these rods around and tune to the cavity. Space above that, for some very, very low noise amplifiers that sit inside their own magnetic field canceling magnets. So we have two magnets that have to cancel each other. So these amplifiers, which are superconducting, can function. We can pull out this inner part to change parts, do upgrades, change frequency of components. And that's what it looks like when we've, when we've extracted the, so the cavity sits there. It's, it's in thermal shields, but it's inside there. That's the second magnet for the amplifier. And that's support infrastructure. Um, so to talk briefly about the, the tuning, how do, we, how do we match the frequency of the cavity to the frequency of the axion, given we don't know the frequency of the axion? Uh, as I mentioned, there are these tuning rods, and so the idea is with the tuning rod in a certain position of this cavity, there's an electromagnetic resonance. You can solve Maxwell's equations. You get a certain frequency, and you move the rod. That frequency moves, and that's how you tune it. So you take data here, you move it, you take data there, and you have sensitivity to the axion here and sensitive, sensitivity to the axion here. Um, if only it was quite so simple. Um, as you well know, inside a, a, an electromagnetic resonator, there's not one mode, there's a myriad of modes. They do not all cap couple to the axion. In fact, most of them don't. To give you a feel for what's going on here, this is uh, frequency versus rod position, and the color indicates transfer function through the cavity, so I've just hooked what's called a network analyzer, where I put power in one side and get power out the other. If I'm on a resonant mode, I, 
the, I get a yellow line. If I'm off, it's red. And then I'm moving these rods around. So each of these maps out how the frequency of a resonant mode changes. And the only one that's at all useful for finding the axion right now looks like that. That's the PM010. All the others have very poor overlap between that, the magnetic field, and the, uh, the, the, the wave function of the axion, which is one, which is one. So looking down, this is, is, is the, the going from the left to right here is taking this from the center all the way to the edge and then back to the center. So not only do we have to be tuning these very carefully for good coverage, we also have to be identifying the correct mode and avoiding all the other modes. And when, these, when one of these modes crosses with another mode, we usually have very poor sensitivity. And so a first pass through, through uh, uh, frequency space usually leaves some gaps, which we can sometimes clean up by moving the other rod and uh, uh, pushing different modes and frequency away from each other. So that's the motion technology. Another important piece of technology is the cryogenics. So uh, ADMX is cooled with a helium-free, helium-4 dilution refrigerator. It's cooled down to about 100 millikelvin. Uh, in our 2017 run, we were uh, around 150. Uh, 2018, we're down to 100. 2019, which has been going on for about a month, we're back. We're also down at 100. Um, and then it's, we've gotten from from this is this is the base temperature of the refrigerator. And now what we're working on is communicating that temperature to all the other parts. The cavity itself has to be this, uh, has to be cooled down. So that, let's see. Last in 2018, the cavity was a little bit hotter. In the fridge in 2019, it's actually the, the this is very close to the, the the temperature of the fridge and the cavity are very very similar. Um, and the lower that is, the the better things are, because in terms of the the black body temperature of photons you see, the speed at which you can scan through frequencies and maintain good signal to noise uh, goes as a, a noise temperature squared. So, but uh, this is half the battle in terms of noise temperature. Some of the photons are thermal from the actual black body radiation, and some of the photons are coming from the amplifiers. The first stage amplifier adds noise. So we want the coldest amplifiers we can get. Um, so a decade ago, those were the, 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 you could use transistor amplifiers that add maybe 2 Kelvin equivalent noise, which means it's worthless to cool things down much below 2 Kelvin. Nowadays, one uses these superconducting quantum limited amplifiers. So these are amplifiers that are coming out of people who are building quantum computers. So they have a huge amount of funding to develop extremely low noise amplifiers so can, they can read these things out. And we've benefited from that because it's in the same, same frequency range. Um, and when I say quantum limited, I, I, what I mean by that is as you cool your amplifier, so here's a plot of, of physical temperature versus the noise addition from that amplifier. As you cool your amplifier, it adds less and less and less and less and less noise. At this point, your amplifier is adding one half photon per resolution bandwidth of uh, noise, and that's actually the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle at work. And so um, with this particular technique, you're not going to get better than that. And that explains why are we cooling down to 100 millikelvin as opposed to 10 millikelvin. You can see at our frequency, this is about where things turn over. So that's about the optimal temperature uh, to be operating at. And so the amplifiers that do this for us um, are collaborators at Berkeley have made. So two years ago, we were using these squid amplifiers. Uh, let's see, yeah, uh, tunable microstrip squid amplifier there. Um, this year and the past year, we're using Josephson parametric amplifiers. Um, for those of you who, who look at how they, the, these, the, the, the qubits, the recent announcements of, of possible quantum supremacy, these are all made with these Josephson junction technology uh, devices and read out in the, in the same sort of way. Um, so for us, it's, it's the, these things have to go into a rather complicated uh, cold electronics package. So this is the, 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 key, the key for us is as we started, we were trying to use these, these amplifiers uh, as much as a decade ago. At the time, they were pretty much laboratory curiosities. And so a lot of the work went into taking something that worked fine by itself. It was the center of the experiment. You were making the measurement with this device and packaging it up, and it's now a tool, it's now a tinker toy that plugs in with everything else and works very reliably. Um, and so this, there's all this extra packaging that goes out, um, and it gets assembled into that, that device there that goes into the heart of the experiment. Um, and so if you combine this cold physical temperature with the cold amplifier, uh, you have very low noise, and your noise determines your sensitivity, and so it's a key scientific parameter to understand what your noise is. Um, and 
the way we do this is we, we tie our noise to the temperature sensors on these various components. So, um, and I'll talk you briefly through. So, so imagine I heat this component here, and I look at the power coming out here. So the power from here comes, oh, excuse me, I'm heating this component here. Um, so the, 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 the thermal noise from this comes out, bounces off the cavity, comes back, bounces off that, gets amplified, comes up here. So I actually am looking at this, the temp temperature of this is related to the power that comes out by gain times the temperature of the thing. And so I can do a series of calibrations where I, I, if I really trust my temperature sensor, I can calibrate my power out to my temperature sensor, and that will go back and tell me what power of axion signal am I sensitive to. So here's a plot of power versus the physical temperature of that attenuator. You can see the power goes up. So this, this is just the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, 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 what's the equation? Just totally blank. Uh, I'll remember it in a second. Anyway, um, right, power, so, so temperature up, power up. This is, this is the primary calibration. You can also see if we just, it takes a few hours to do this. Um, so this gets us, what's the noise temperature of our system with our quantum amplifiers off? It turns out the, the, the gain of the quantum amplifiers is not super steady over eight hours. And so you first you get the whole system with the quantum amplifiers on. Then you turn the quantum amplifiers on, and there's two knobs you turn on them. And you turn them while watching the gain and the increase in power coming out. So you get these maps here. Um, so the, the two knobs you have are pump power and bias current. So this is a parametric amplifier, so it's a pumped amplifier. And as you tweak these things, you measure the gain. So 22 dB of gain around here. You measure the increase in noise power coming out. Um, so 6 dB here. And from these two things, you subtract them and get the, the, the improvement in signal to noise. You take the noise you've done, you've, the, the noise calibration you've done with the temperature sensor, and you leverage that to get the exact system noise. And what's more is if you're making a map like this, you can have a computer do this every 10 minutes and then track so you make sure you always have the minimum noise temperature you can get at your particular frequency range. And that tells you how sensitive to the axion you're going to be. Um, And so you can start looking for axions. So the uh, the so you start making plots like this. So you've made these. You've you've made power spectra from the data you've taken. You look. You've subtracted off the background, and you're looking at excess power. Here it is in units of what I expect from a DFSC axion. You do them. You plot them versus frequency, and you're looking for lumps or bumps that could indicate excess power. And I have this because it's a it's, 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 there's a great story behind this one. This was this was the the, um, the first bump that we we categorized as an axion, and that's with good reason is because um, last year's run was the first run where we had a dedicated team that was injecting signals into our cavity. They have a cable that runs down to the bottom of the cavity, and they have a signal generator, and they've taped off all the, the, the readouts of the signal generator so no one on site knows whether it's on or not. Um, and they peer, and, and if, we, if we call them and say, we would like a test signal at this frequency, please add this test signal at this frequency. But they're also allowed to put in blind injections. And then they do this blind injection. Uh, and our procedure is we make one pass over the frequency range, those are these blue dots here. You can see there's some statistical vari variation. There's a threshold for candidates Things power above this can power above this threshold indicates a candidate axion signal. When we have candidate axion signals, fortunately in, in ADMX, you can just go back and check the check that frequency the next week. This is not this is this is very different from maybe other dark matter detectors where you have to keep the whole thing closed and blind for years and you open it up and you see three counts. And you're like, well, that's you know, does, I guess I gotta run it some more. With with this, the, the blue data is taken over the course of about 20 minutes. And then we, we, we run for a while, and about a week later, we say, okay, this is a candidate axion. If it's truly dark matter, it's still going to be there when we tune the, the experiment back there. So we reverse our direction. We tune back to that. We take more data. It's much, much, uh, we, about four times as much data. So we get these orange dots here. So you can see there was even a statistical fluctuation candidate that disappeared when we took more data. Um, and yet, still, this persisted. Um, 
and it passed our various other checks for what a persistent candidate would be. And so <clears throat> at that point, we said, okay, we're going to ramp down the magnet. When we ramp down the magnet, we will see the signal go away. But first, let us call our synthetic injection committee and have them open the envelope, and they open the envelope. And they're like, oh, congratulations. If there had been an axion there, you would have found it, but it's actually a synthetic injection. So we're very proud of this because this is what one, one thing within the collaboration is we're trying to keep the mindset of we are out there to make a discovery, and this keeps us on our toes. And so I'm, I'm, I'm proud that whole, whole procedure worked. Um, let me talk a little bit about what's, you know, what, what we're actually looking for in terms of the signal shape. So the shape of the signal, it's not a delta function. It has some width. And this is because dark matter has some temperature around us. It has some velocities. Uh, uh, and that would give, the, give, give it a line shape. Is it just in the, it's, it's red shifted and blue shifted, depending on whether it's coming or going. The most uh, vanilla model you can think of astrophysics, the isothermal halo, gives you a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So you get a shape like this. This is what, this is what we say is that it's fairly conservative because if you're much, um, you, can't make, you can't make your dark matter distribution much wider without having a significant fraction of the axions have escape velocity from the galaxy and so the galaxy would fall apart. So we say this is fairly conservative. There are some models, uh, in-body simulation models, and also some of the, the recent Gaia data has suggested that dark matter might be a little bit a little bit colder, maybe a little bit denser in our region, you know, our neck of the woods of the, of the galaxy. And so this green curve represents that, and we look for both of these so we can do a, a, a match filter to both of these line shapes. And so you'll see in, in limits that we have two limits, then that's kind of an optimistic and um, uh, pessimistic versions of astrophysics for what we're sensitive to. So this is all about what would happen in a single region of frequency space we have to cover a large region of frequency space. So um, <clears throat> the procedure is the rods are in some place. You digitize power coming out of the cavity. You make a power spectrum. You move the rods slightly. You then That changes the resonant frequency. You map out the resonant frequency of the cavity, and you digitize again over and over and over again. Um, and then at the end of the week, you get to go through this procedure where you um, <clears throat> ask yourself, are there excesses for candidates that I should re-scan? I can show you one more example of this procedure here. So um, let's see. So this is, so th these are power spectra. So imagine these are background subtracted, properly normalized power spectra. So these are white noise, mostly. In this case, I've got some synthetic injections, but these are done on computer. So they're not blind. They're just done so for, for the purposes of making sure our analysis works. And you can see what happens is as we move our cavity frequency onto uh, an axion signal, the signal gets bigger and bigger. We go here, we scan back, uh, and you can see it when you're near resonance. When you're far off resonance, you can't see it very well. This one is obvious in a single scan. There's one here that's not obvious in any, any of the scans until you add them all up together and do the match filter, which is done here. So that's what a KSBZ type signal would look like. That's what a DFSC signal would look like. And we do injections like this to prove to ourselves, okay, we believe we have the sensitivity um, you know, up to, the cal up, up to our, our, our calibration chain to find an axion if it's there. Now, these are not the only things that we see, or rather axions are not the only, axions and synthetics are not the only things that we see in our data. Sometimes there are other candidates. Um, there can be statistical fluctuations. The, there are many, many, many bins being sampled. So there is, there is a look elsewhere kind of, kind of issue here. Um, and there are RF interference. So we're in the frequency band of cell phones, Wi-Fi, TV, radio. We are heavily shielded. We're many, many layers of metal. So um, it's hard for signals to get, get into our data, but it can be. There's time, there's some, someone unplugs a cable up top, that cable can act like an antenna, and you get a signal. Um, fortunately, we have some ways of identifying what these are. So for one, if you see a signal in the experiment and you see a signal in the room, that is radio frequency interference coming in, and you need to spend some time sealing up your experiment. If it comes and goes, that's not what we know about dark matter. Uh, we believe dark matter, at least within the, the solar system scale, is fairly smooth. And if it's, if it's, if it's there at some time, it'll be there some other time. Um, so we're allowed to reject uh, uh, signals that are not persistent, that they're there one day and not the next. Um, the signal has to follow the Lorentzian line shape of the cavity. We reject several signals uh, in our last run that do not follow the Lorentzian line shape, which is indicative of them leaking in downstream of our resonator and not being an axion signal. Um, we've not ever 
quite had to, to do this, but we can, I, to, I told you that there are all these modes that are not sensitive to axions. All those other modes are, are also sensitive to RFI. And so we can, I, we can map out for each mode what's its sensitivity for the axion, and we can tune each mode onto the ax, axion candidate frequency and identify that, yes, this has the right, uh, uh, I guess, wave function shape to be an axion. Finally, we can turn down the, uh, the B squared of the magnet, the, 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 the return of the magnet field, and the signal strength should go as B squared. Once we've done all this, that should identify a, a signal as, a, as an axion. We can finally go back and look for some modulation. The Earth is, of course, turning, so there's going to be small modulation. It's sub, it's, it's, it's sub line shape, so it's not going to be easy to see until we've really tracked the, the signal for quite a long time. But there's, most, there's both the Earth's turning and the, the motion of the Earth around the sun. So that means that when you do have a signal, you can turn this around and do dark matter astronomy with the signal that you have automatically with the experiment, just, you know, the, the, the day after you, you decide you make a discovery, it's turned into a telescope. So having done this uh, procedure and, and been able to eliminate all signals, we haven't found the axion yet. Uh, I'm able to talk about what exclusions we can uh, set here. So here's my plot again of axion photon coupling versus frequency, or if you prefer, axion mass. So uh, 80 mechs a decade ago was setting limits here at the KSVZ level. And so now we are reaching down into this very uh, uh, exciting theoretical region and excluding axions um, there. And so the 2018 was the orange, uh, and then the green is uh, the data that was released. It was the, the paper that we released uh, yesterday. I think it showed up on the archive. Um, and then the, the, so the light is this opt, is, is the, maybe the optimistic, op, optimistic astrophysical line shape. The dark is the conservative. And so in all cases, we uh, are able to at least ex exclude where we need to touch the DFSC. Um, so the, the takeaway from this is, well, okay, you know, someone else didn't find dark matter. What I do want to brag about is the, the just the range of coverage from 2018 to, um, last, to, to the data taking last year. You can see there's a lot more green than there is orange, and that means we're increasing our scan speed. Since we're in this business to find dark matter, uh, we now have an experiment that's sensitive to this DFSC model. We're sensitive to the really plausible, exciting dark matter. Our goal is to scan faster and faster and faster and cover a wider and wider range, because that's the only way that we're going to, to make a discovery. That's how we make the discovery sooner and sooner. So um, I'm excited that we're able to increase our speed and that we're able to move closer to a discovery. So right now we're taking data to give you a feel for um, the, the, where we're taking data. I showed you a plot like this, which means you, you automatically are all now, are now experts since I described it again, but I'll just, just to, to reiterate, this is a mode map, frequency, rod position. That's that nice TM010 mode. So we went up to about 780. So we, let's see, we, we went up to about 800 megahertz here. So we're going to start at about 800 megahertz here, and it covers up to uh, about 1030 megahertz. And so that's going to be this year's chunk of data taking, and so maybe we'll find the axion then. So I suppose we're, we're operating, actually, we're operating right through there. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, let me get back to it. Just So there's a question of, of oh, this narrow gap? Yeah, okay. So so in here, there are places we have not covered. And in almost all the cases, these are due to those mode crossings where the, the as we tune our cavity, we have a like a TE mode, which is completely insensitive to the, to the axion, hits our TM mode, it mixes, and we cannot guarantee sensitivity, and so we do not acquire data there. Um, now, you know, ideally, we want those to be as small as possible, um, but... When you build the hardware, you get what you get, and uh, we hope we have time later in the experiment to build cavities that, if you just all you have to do is you you build a new cavity that's slightly different geometry, and you can cover that. Um, unfortunately, it's once you've done that, there's there's kind of this three month procedure to change out cavities, and so uh, I, I I can't claim that those will be covered anytime soon. They're they're at the very end. We hope to come back and clean up those regions. I guess I can also brag, you don't see any mode crossings on this plot, and it's not that they aren't there. They're just much smaller and much narrower, and that's a, that's a tribute to the work done on the cavity designers who did, or rather the, the rod designers who did 
this year's rods as opposed to last year's rods is they went back and found ways to make those mode crossings very, very small. So I believe there's a tiny, tiny one there and one there, but they're much smaller than the, uh, the, the data from last year. Right, so I said we're taking data. Um, right, there's, there's, there's some proud postdocs and, and grad students uh, with posing by the, the experiment before it went in for today's data, to, for, for this, this year's data taking. There I took some data uh, from this morning's, just the, the, the online readout showing, yep, there's still, there's a resonance there. We are coupled to that resonance. There's power coming out. That lump is not an axion. That's a transfer function that actually uh, uh, Jan Van Rana might know better than me because we were talking about uh, feedback systems in there, but it's still, that's, it's, uh, this is where we would be looking for axions. Um, right, so that's where we're going this year up to uh, 1030 megahertz. Let's talk about going beyond that, because if you recall, there were good axion mass predictions up to um, not just not just in the, the 1 gigahertz region, not in the 2 gigahertz region, but all the way up to 10, maybe even a little more. And so clearly we, we've taken the first step on a long journey. How do we keep going? Um, our plan, our, the, the, the current G2 program in the next few years is to cover this region. We have funding to do the R&D, to build the cavities to go to this region. This gets harder and harder. Um, why does it get harder and harder? Well, the, the, nat the, the frequency goes up, wavelength goes down, natural cavity size goes down, less volume, less dark matter converting, just less signal and it hurts you. Um, as you get to higher and higher frequencies, the resonator quality factor tends to go down. And then um, the standard quantum limit, so this, this, you, get, you always have this extra half photon uncertainty because the signal is being amplified, and the photons get bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of, of energy. Um, and all of these things hurt and make it harder, and so this is something we work on to improve now so we can keep the experiment going. And the directions we're looking at are large volume resonators that have these high frequencies but still large physical extent to couple well to the axion field. We're looking at uh, sub-quantum limited amplifiers. So this is, this is pushing the, the edges of, of you know, quantum measurement to say, well, do I, you know, do I really need the, uh, the, the, the obey the standard quantum limit or is there a way around? You can always buy a bigger magnet until you run out of money. So we're looking at options for what's, what's a way to, to optimally turn funding dollars into B squared V that will increase our axion sensitivity. And then also looking at ways to make high Q resonators. Lots of people make high Q res higher Q resonators than we have now are copper cavities. They're just copper. So we're looking at Qs of 100,000. You can make superconducting cavities that uh, have much higher Qs but they don't naturally work in a magnetic field. So we're looking at ways to do that. I can talk about just a few of my favorites of these. Um, for one, if your resonators get smaller, get more resonators. So as we double the frequency, the natural cavity size is decreased by two. Well, we can fit four of those inside our experiment. As you can imagine, if you've, you know, you've ever, ever watched a watchmaker, this gets harder. Um, because each of these is now being tuned and they all have to be tuned together and they all have to be added uh, to the, the signals from all of them have to be added together in phase coherently to get the full volume effect of coupling to the axion. And yet we have designed one of these things. There it is. And there's the half scale prototype that's already been built. I believe, I think we actually have this full scale being built and is about to be tested to be re uh, ready in a, a year and a bit from now. Um, as you go into higher frequencies, you can imagine continuing to scale these resonators. The, the mechanics become more and more complicated, but there's still several factors of two you can gain in terms of moving up in frequency space. And to the, 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 the aim of mastering the mechanics of this, we actually have a uh, um, kind of a stowaway on our experiment. It's called the sidecar cavity. This is, this, this, this is my graduate student who, who went and said, oh, you know, there's this fifth size space that no one's using in the experiment. I think I want to put another one in there. And so built a cavity that uses, so it's much smaller. So it's, we're accessing higher frequencies and it gives us a chance to use the advanced technology we want to try out for the future. So right now we have a stepper motor that turns a rod that goes to a gearbox inside. So a millikelvin gearbox that's grinding away. Um, we're going to move to piezo motors that have been tested on this, so that was one of the things. And um, we've also looked at higher order modes. I told you the TM010 
mode is the only one that really couples to the axion. I lied. The 0, 2, 0 couples at kind of one quarter strength. The 0, 3, 0 couples at like one ninth strength. So there's other ones out there that are suppressed. Maybe it's just better to use one of those higher order modes to couple to the axion instead of building a smaller cavity. That was also tested in this experiment. We learned a whole lot from it, and we actually were even able to exclude some axion-like particle parameter space. So I think the important one to look at here, um, uh, so if you imagine this being the coupling and that being the mass, so ADMX proper is operating down here, and this sidecar system is able to reach here, here, and here, and that was this was just operation without quantum limited amplifiers. So we're pretty sure we can build the cavities we need to continue our exploration working up. Um, Oh, and this year, this year we have a, a, one of these new traveling wave parametric amplifiers that I saw turn on with great gain. So I'm, this is a very exciting kind of thing. Right. Um, so I've tried to convince you that we can keep building up to, uh, uh, you know, some, some noticeable fraction of 10 gigahertz. Things get really ugly here. Now your cavities are getting absolutely tiny. The quantum limit is 10 times higher. Uh, how are we going to get there? And so I will just very briefly mention a few options. Addressing the standard quantum limit. So the, the standard quantum limit comes from saying there, there's, we're measuring the number of photons coming into our cavity and we're measuring the phase and those are conjugate variables. And since we measure both of them, there's uncertainty that's just ha baked in there. Do you care about the, the phase of axion dark matter? Is it, can you imagine someone giving a talk and saying, oh, I've discovered axion dark matter and the first question is like, oh, yeah, what, what was the phase? No, we don't care about the phase. That information can be thrown away and by throwing that information away, you can actually have less uncertainty on the number of photons and the power of, of axion dark matter conversion. And there's a number of ways to approach that. You can approach that through squeezing, um, or you can approach it through quantum non-demolition measurements. In this one, this, so, so, so here's one of, one of the ones that I give for example. This is, this is basically uh, one of these Josephson qubits. So you have a cavity there. You have a, 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 this, this artificial atom there, and they're coupled together there, so that thing fits in there. Um, and you can measure by measuring a frequency shift how many photons are in the cavity. Now, if we were building a quantum computer, we would now say, okay, so I can, I can put photons in the cavity. I need to shift them around and, and modify them. Fortunately, we don't need that. We just need to know, is there a photon in there or isn't there? And so that technology is already available, and it's just a matter of adapting it for our uses so that we can count photons. Um, for those of you in high energy physics, it's what we're trying to make is a, is a photo tube. We're trying to make a microwave photo tube. I don't know if anyone who uses a photo tube points to that and says, this is, this is definitely a squeezed measurement because I'm throwing away phase information. But you can say that if you want. Um, so this looks like a very promising direction, and there's a number of other directions you can go with it um, and would solve the, the standard quantum limit going up. There's also, um, in terms of resonators, uh, we can move away from this kind of simple tin can system and look at more exotic resonances. So we can do things with dielectrics, for example. I will show, let's see, so this one. So the problem, the problem with higher order modes is, let's say you, you, you have your, your mode in the box and you look at the second order mode and the electric field is pointing up in one side and down on the other. The axion couples to both of them and these two things cancel out. And so you get no coupling. But if I take my box and I fill it half with a dielectric, I can take the part with the, 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 the out-of-phase electric field is squeezed down into a small part, and I can still have good coupling to the axion. So I then can, you know, by induction, I can do a whole bunch of these and get a very large volume at a high frequency that couples well to the axion, um, to which the next question should be, how do, we, how do we tune it so we can actually search for the axion? And that's where things get a little hard, and I have uh, uh, a number of students working on there. These, here's a, this, this, this is a tunable multi-dielectric system to, to do an axion experiment. There's one using a, 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 an open resonator. Open resonators naturally have a much higher Q than closed resonators because there's less places to lose, uh, to, to lose energy, and so this may be a way to get uh, higher Qs. Um, there are people looking into uh, dielectrically tuned cavities and I, I heard actually a lot of really good ideas talking to faculty today. So um, I think this, this is another great direction to be pursued. So um, I think I will uh, wrap up then. And I will say it's a great time to be looking for axions. Um, it's, it's the, the, the prediction is 
40, 40 years old. They, 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 so this is 40 years ago that people were talking about axions as dark matter. An experiment has been a long time in catching up. But finally, we are able to explore the, the most plausible couplings at the most plausible masses to make axion dark matter. We've built an experiment to do that. We're covering these masses faster and faster each year, and we're hungry. So we're, we're, we, everyone in the group is, is excited to make a discovery. So we're out there looking for it. Um, at the same time, to continue the search, we've already got R&D programs underway to build better and better experiments, still get higher and higher frequencies, and hopefully cover this entire plausible space. So I feel like discovery could come at any time, and I'm super excited to share that with you. So thank you very much for listening. Right. Okay. So, so um, I talked a lot about the, the 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 kind of most classic production mechanism of axions, where it happens after uh, uh, Petrichor symmetry is broken after inflation, and there's one looks at this one to hundred micro eV axion, and you're so, so there, there's also a model where you break Petrichor symmetry before in before inflation, at which point. You, you can certainly be allowed to make mu make dark make the right amount of dark matter with much lower mass axions. Is that and then you're question, asking about experiments that do that? All right. Okay. So um, my experiment can't look there. You, so you, and, it, and 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 cavity experiments don't scale well because you have a natural size that gets bigger and bigger, and then that means you have to have a magnet that's bigger and bigger to fit into it. However, there are some very clever people who have gotten around that, they're no longer using geometric resonators, they're using LC circuit style things. So these are people like DM Radio, Abracadabra. Um, they've got a long ways, you know, they've got a long ways to go because they're just starting now and it takes, you know, decades of work to build an experiment like this. Um, I forget, did I, did I have, did I pull in my Abracadabra? I don't think I, I pulled in my, my slide showing their, their limits, but um, it's, it's certainly conceivable to be looking for these lower mass axions, um, and it's, it'll be a long haul, but I think it's doable. Below that, one can look for, uh, um, it's like time varying EDMs, and, and which is well, probably beyond the scope of what I should go into. Well, yeah, so yeah, so you can see it in everything now, and the question is who was first? And I've, 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 and I've certainly heard that, that, that I've, I've heard claim that Oort has um, comments about the, 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 the clusters before Zwicky, but I wasn't there before my time, but thank you for the correction. Um, well, I don't, can't is a pretty strong word, but that's, that's actually, it's, it's, it's a clever idea. I would, the, the, there's an awkwardness that we're also, we have to keep the, the, the field canceled. So all of these superconducting devices work. And so I think a modulation would be tricky and I'm not sure when, once you're down, once, once you're down near the standard quantum limit. It'd be it'd be interesting to look and see if you could if you could gain anything out of it.
Um, so by the time you reach 10 gigahertz, so I, I, I talked about either quantum non volition or squeezing. By the time you get to 10 gigahertz, it's, it's pretty clear you want to be using one of these other measurements. You wouldn't be using a, a, a linear amplifier. So a, a, one of these tupas is a great way to, to um, frankly, save some engineering time because they're, they're nice and broadband, and so you don't have to swap out your components as much. Um, and they go up well above 10 gigahertz, but my expectation is by the time we are above 10 gigahertz, then it's time to um, use one of these more, you know, m m more deep quantum measurement techniques. Um, you're asking, does this, does, does, would a null result over some range give information about where to look next? Um, let's see. So if you're, so, so if you want like a hidden sector photon, a dark photon, that, you get that search for free. That's you're you're sensitive to to um, you know heavy very weakly mixing photons that the the, the, ex, the experiment as is um, even if the magnet was off you get data that would detect those and so that's useful um, so I'm trying to think is is there so so we at one point did a, a search for um, scalar chameleons which was an interesting dark energy candidate, but it was a very narrow, you, it had, it was, you had, had to have kind of a just so story where you could produce these things that would then rattle around in your cavity and then you would pick them back up and detect them. That was kind of a cool thing. Um, if you're talking about where, like where to go, so if, we, if, we, if, so if ADMX G2 sweeps this, this range, there's no axion, that doesn't rule the axion out. It means we've looked in some, some of what I thought was the best space, but as pointed out, there's lower mass axions to be looking for that's totally allowed. And, and you, you know, you can cite the anthropic principle or you don't even have to, to, to justify some of them. Um, and there's even, so a, 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 axions are permitted all the way up to uh, a little bit above a milli EV, um, at which point you are starting to interfere with the, the evolution of stars. So there's still um, a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done even after the, the close of the region that I was talking about. 